now we will talk about the pros and cons of different valuation methods first let's look at the pros and cons of uh, of the comparables based valuation method so we've already talked about this to some extent when we talk about comparables we are saying that we are making decisions on whether stocks are underpriced or overpriced based on say the pe ratio or the price to book value ratio or price to cash flow ratio and so on so what are the advantages of using this method one advantage is that it has been shown that historically ratios such as pe and price to book value have been useful in predicting future returns uh, more specifically it has been seen that value stocks which are stocks with generally low pe ratio or relatively low price to book value ratio these tend to perform well in the future the economic justification is that when pe ratios are low that implies that stocks are relatively undervalued and clearly it makes sense to invest when stocks are relatively undervalued obviously the hope is that uh, stocks are temporarily undervalued and over time when they adjust to appropriate values the investor will do well and there is evidence which suggests that buying stocks with relatively low pe or price to book value ratios will tend to do well another simple point is that these multiples such as pe ratio and price to book value ratio are very widely used so most investment analysis will have a component that talks about the multiples or the ratios for stocks pe ratios and other kinds of multiples are easily available so especially if you talk about trailing ratios you simply do price divided by last year's earnings or price divided by last year's cash flow per share and so on so these are relatively easy to compute and hence easily available using multiples it is straightforward to do time series comparison so for example if you are looking at a given industry you can look at how the pe ratio is changing over time and if at a given point in time pe ratio is relatively high this means that possibly stocks are overvalued and when pe ratio might be below average that implies that stocks are undervalued and clearly it makes sense to make investment decisions when the pe ratio is below average cross sectional comparison means that you are comparing say multiples such as pe ratios for different companies but at the same point in time so in 2010 if you are looking at the pe for a versus the pe ratio for b versus the pe ratio for for company c this is called a cross sectional analysis where at one point in time you are looking at a given multiple across an industry to figure out which shares in the industry are relatively overvalued and which shares are relatively undervalued for stocks or companies which have a relatively high percentage of debt in the capital structure it makes sense to use enterprise value divided by ebitda so this gives a big picture idea of whether a company is overvalued or undervalued the disadvantages one commonly stated disadvantage is that when we use lagging ratio such as price over e not this tells us about the past and not about the future but the counter to this is that we can also use forward looking ratio such as p over e1 but obviously in a forward looking ratio the earnings number is going to be an estimate another disadvantage is that ratio such as pe might not always be comparable across firms so even though you have three firms in the same industry but they might be in slightly different segments or they might have slightly different strategies where one company like intel might have uh, one kind of strategy versus amd might have a slightly different strategy and that strategy might impact earnings so even though you have companies in the same industry but the ratios might not be completely comparable another example is where different companies have uh, different lines of business and uh, let's say that you are in the same industry but there are company a has several divisions that do something slightly different then can you compare the ratio of a and b the answer is not always or 
uh, the way we deal with this then is make adjustments uh, to try and make the ratios as comparable as possible. Another point is that ratios are impacted by economic conditions. So if in general you are at the bottom of a business cycle, then clearly because you are in this business cycle and this, this point is more relevant for cyclic stocks that we've spoken about earlier. Obviously earnings will be relatively low when you are at the bottom of or when you are in the trough of a business cycle and so one would expect PE ratios to be relatively high at this stage so earnings being relatively low and actually it depends so so depends on what's happening with price but the whole point is that as you go through business cycles that is going to have an impact on the ratios sometimes this method using comparables where you are coming up with what the appropriate PE should be based on industry averages this might conflict with the fundamental method for coming up with ratios which we will talk about on the next slide and which we've talked about earlier but the question is what do you do if the fundamental method which as a quick recap was something like this where we said that the PE ratio is equal to the payout ratio over R minus G if this method is giving you a, a number that's different from the number that you come using a comparables method then what do you do so that conflict is another disadvantage sensitive to different accounting methods you might have different companies that have different accounting methods and hence are coming up with slightly different numbers for earnings so if the accounting methods are different then what do you do so that's a disadvantage the way you might deal with it is make adjustments to the numbers of both companies that you are comparing so as to put them on a level playing field negative denominator implies the, Im, implies that some ratios such as price to earnings there might be times when earnings are negative so when earnings are negative then ratios such as pe are meaningless and and to deal with this we might also use ratios like price to sales for example or also enterprise value to ebitda but from an exam perspective you need to know at least one or two lines about all these bullets that have been identified here now let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of the discounted cash flow method first the advantages the discounted cash flow methods are based on the present value of future cash flows and this is uh, theoretically very good because essentially what we are doing is saying the present value or the value of a share is based on future cash flows and we simply discount these cash flows back and get the value of an asset so in theory this is great and this is in fact very widely used and accepted most analyst reports that you will look at will come up with some intrinsic value and that value will more often than not be based on some form of discounted cash flow analysis on the disadvantages side the inputs have to be estimated and then estimates are very sensitive to inputs so just to give you a very simple example even if you assume a situation where you are where you know your next dividend of let's say you actually you have to estimate your dividend let's say the dividend is 10 let's say that your uh, discount rate is uh, 13 percent and let's say that your growth rate is approximately three percent the value of the share then will be approximately equal to 10 over 0.13 minus 0.03 which is 0 0.100 so clearly even in this simplistic discounted cash flow method we had to estimate our dividend our cost of equity our growth rate and what if the growth rate instead of being three percent actually turns out to be two percent then the value of the share becomes 10 divided by 0 0.13 minus 0 so this is now 2 percent so the denominator becomes 0 0.11 which is 90.9 so only based on a 1 percent difference in growth rate we have approximately a 10 percent difference in value which is huge so discounted cash flow methods generally are very sensitive to the inputs that we use
in terms of price multiples valuation based on fundamentals they have the same advantages and disadvantages as the discounted cash flow method because as you saw earlier the pe ratios here are calculated based on fundamental values of a company so we saw that the pe ratio for a company for example would be equal to the payout ratio divided by r minus g so we need to estimate the payout ratio for a company the cost of equity for a company growth rate of a company and hence as you see up here the value of the pe will be sensitive to the assumptions that we make related to the company finally let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of asset based models in terms of advantages when we do a asset based valuation that in a sense gives us a floor value so if we can say that the value of assets minus the value of liabilities is giving you the total value of equity then if we are using the correct asset the correct market values for assets and the correct market value for liabilities then at the very least our equity should be worth this amount so if assets are 100 liabilities are 20 then at the very least our share should be worth 80 so that's why we say it gives a floor value works when assets have easily determine determinable market value so when our assets and our liabilities have easily determinable market values then this is great then it's easy to use and a lot of companies are now presenting fair values for their assets and liabilities and if that is the case then this model is relatively easy to use in terms of disadvantages for a lot of companies especially large manufacturing companies it is actually hard to determine the market value of the assets so in scenarios where it's hard to determine market values clearly this method has limited use very often the market value for assets can be quite different from book values and again if those market values are hard to estimate then an analysis based purely on book values can be quite misleading uh market so when we use uh, when we look at book values for example very as an intangible assets might not even be shown so as you saw in the segment on financial reporting and analysis if a company has built its own goodwill for example a company such as mcdonalds when you tr if you try to value mcdonalds based on uh, market value of assets and liabilities mcdonalds will not show any asset related to its uh, relative to its brand so the brand is an intangible asset which is not shown on the books and how do you estimate that if you are simply using the assets and liabilities or if other intangible assets such as patents or copyrights have been developed in house and they are not shown on the books then again your analysis of, uh, in terms of the value of the firm where you are using assets and liabilities if it ignores the value of the intangible assets then the number that you come up with will be misleading also at times of hyperinflation the values that are shown for assets and liabilities might also be uh, misleading so if you have hyperinflation then uh, using asset based models might not be very reasonable and that is it as always you need to practice uh, very hard if you have any comments you should post your comments and if you like this video then please click on the like button